Hey, welcome back. Today we are going to look at Richard III, the final book in the War of Roses tetralogy by Shakespeare. This play is the culmination of all the action that builds through Henry VI, part one, two, and three. And although this play can definitely be studied on its own, it pulls heavily from the action that happened in those other plays. When we talked about them previously, we saw England lose its heroes, descend into revenge and civil war. At the end of Henry VI, part three, we saw the death of Henry VI and the rise of Edward, the son of the Duke of York. And now that Edward is on the throne, it looks as though we're finally going to resolve all this time of tempests and civil war and have a kind of peace. But we also noted in that last play that one of our characters has a transformation. Richard, the son of York. Richard, who is now Richard of Gloucester. In that play, he grows into the villain that he ultimately becomes in Richard III. This play was very, very popular during Shakespeare's life, and, and the role of Richard III was very, very well celebrated. It was played by Shakespeare's lead actor, Richard Burbage. And Burbage was really known for this role, so much that he was referred to as Richard III all around town, apparently. This was also one of Shakespeare's plays that was most reprinted during Shakespeare's lifetime. Wildly popular, even though it centers on a villain. If there is a hero, it's Richmond. But he really only appears at the very end of the play as a ushering in of the Tudor dynasty. And he's pretty flat. Richard is the character who's so much fun. And as we pointed out in the previous play, Shakespeare is playing with ideas that he's taken from Machiavelli's The Prince. Machiavelli was interested in how to gain a kingdom and hold on to it. And he gives a guide to princes who want to consolidate and be certain of their kingship. Instead of thinking of the ethics and morality of a good king, he says, well, what is more pragmatic and practical for a king? Is it important for a king never to tell a lie? Or is it more advantageous for him to tell lies when it seems appropriate? When it gets him what he wants? Is it important for a prince to be holy and virtuous and righteous or effective? And Machiavelli says that it's important for a prince to appear righteous sometimes, but not necessarily to do so. He needs to be able to shove his scruples aside and get the job done on certain occasions. Machiavelli was seen as being a very dark look at leadership. It's a fascinating book, and I have another video on it if you'd like to watch it. You can click on the card. But Shakespeare takes the ideas of Machiavelli and uses them to help create his character of Richard. Although well, Richard's not a perfect Machiavellian prince. He has a swift path to power, but he isn't as good at holding on to his power. He speaks using lots of religious language, always saying, oh, by St. Paul, and acting as if he is such a pure, sweet, good-hearted person, when really, clearly, he's a villain. He also has absolutely no scruples and is willing to cut through anyone who gets in his way, even his own family. He is a colossal jerk. And although his rise to power is really exciting, once he gets there, he doesn't really know what to do with his power. And there is his fall. A lot of the fun of this play stems not just from watching Richard work, which is very exciting and entertaining, but also the way he turns the audience and draws us in. He likes to have a little tete-a-tete -tete with these asides to the audience, telling us what he plans to do and how much he's enjoying the process of cutting through his family to get the kingship. He's a dark and sinister guy, but he's wildly entertaining. It's only once he has completely glutted himself in the blood of his own family and risen to the top that we begin to find him unpalatable. He becomes more and more abrasive and paranoid as the play goes on. At first, he has that charm, a villain's charm, but he loses it somewhere along the way. There's also the wonderful final arcs of a lot of, of the other characters that we've seen in the past Henry plays. There's Margaret, who we've been developing for three plays. Remember her? She was wild and intense, ambitious and strong. A person who, at one point, carried the head of her boyfriend around for a while after he'd been decapitated. Someone who wiped a father's face with a bloody handkerchief covered in his son's blood. She's an intense person, and we see her now as an older woman who has been so injured by life. She's lost everything, and she is bitter, and she is angry, and she sort of haunts the play. She actually only shows up in a few scenes, but 
she becomes a kind of ghost that lives in the play all the way through. We also see several other characters whose deeds throughout the previous plays are finally catching up with them, so pay attention as we go through. The play begins with Richard walking onto the stage and setting the tone for the whole thing with a soliloquy. This is his play, he is going to direct the audience where he wants them to go. And he starts very much where we left off. At the end of the last play, everything seemed like it was finally settled. Edward was on the throne, things seemed to be resolved, war is over, peace is in the kingdom, and that's really where we begin. Richard says, now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by the son of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarums changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass, I, that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph, I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up, that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them, why I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time unless to see my shadow in the sun and descant on mine own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasure of these days. Plots have I laid up, inductions dangerous by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate the one against the other, and if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs the murderer shall be. Richard paints this picture, oh, everybody's just so relaxed and happy, the world is finally summer, after all of our winter of discontent, after all this civil wars and miseries, now we're all happy, we're all cheerful now. But I'm not fit for cheer. I am ugly and twisted. Remember that Richard is a hunchback, and so his physical form shows the twistedness of his soul, and he buys into that completely. There's a lot of debate over how twisted he really is physically. Some projections make him very hunchbacked and ugly. Others play up the fact that maybe this is more in his mind than anything else. But he chooses to be the villain because he just doesn't fit this comfortable, happy time of peace. He'd rather stir things up. And in fact, he already has. He's already set Edward against Clarence, his other brother. So one of his brothers is King, King Edward. The other brother is Clarence. And if you remember Clarence, Clarence was a triple turncoat in the last play. Well, now Clarence is playing it straight and on the side of his brother, but Richard wants to get rid of him because he's an obstacle on the way to Richard's ascendance to the throne. And so, as soon as he finishes this speech, in comes Clarence being led to prison because of something that Richard has said to Edward. And he sits beside Clarence and, and sympathizes with him and says, Oh, Clarence, I'm so sorry that this has happened to you. How awful. I can't believe that Edward would do this to you. When it's definitely all of Richard's fault. And he says, Oh, I'll do everything in my power to get you released and get you back on good terms with the king. Yeah, no. At this point, Hastings, who has been in prison up till now, has just been released, and Richard comes up to him. And Richard loves to play innocent and play, Oh, Hastings, so good to see you. I'm so sorry this happened to you. I'm so glad that you're finally released from prison. And he emphasizes how the Queen's brothers, 
who we have a lot of tension with. If you remember Queen Elizabeth, Lady Grey, from the last play, she marries Edward, and Edward's family doesn't find her advisable. She's, after all, the widow of somebody who fought on the opposite side of the war. And so all of her brothers, there's a lot of tension between the royal family and the family of the Queen. And so Hastings really hates the Queen's brothers. And Richard plays the innocent, but also talks about how, wow, they really just had it in for you, didn't they? Scene one ends with Richard reflecting on the fact that Edward is already sickly and is probably going to die. But first, Richard needs to get Clarence dead so that Clarence is out of the way before Edward dies and the throne needs to go to somebody else. Scene two is a remarkable scene, one of the most memorable scenes in the whole play. It begins with Anne, who is the daughter-in-law of King Henry VI. And she is going with the corpse of her father-in-law to his burial. If you remember, Henry VI was killed in the previous play. And of course, Shakespeare plays with time all over the place here. But she's grieving over the death of her father-in-law, as well as the death of her husband, both of whom were killed directly by Richard. And Richard shows up on the scene and has this crazy wooing scene over the coffin. Anne is at first horrified because here's the murderer of her father-in-law and her husband. And yet Richard is so slick and so able to twist things around and enforce his expectations on things that she ultimately is won over by the end of the scene. He tells her that he killed them out of love for her. And he keeps taking things and twisting them around as if he were the one who was doing the right thing. And she curses him and she spits at him, but he is so persistent and so audacious in his wooing of her that he finally wins her over. At one point, he hands her a sword and says, well, if you hate me, just go ahead and kill me then. But she can't do that. And so he sort of forces her into believing that she wants to marry him. After she leaves, he sends the body off to be buried, and he turns around and speaks to the audience again in another great soliloquy. Was ever woman in this humor wooed? Was ever woman in this humor won? I'll have her, but I will not keep her long. What? I that killed her husband and his father? To take her in her heart's extremest hate, with curses in her mouth, tears in her eyes, the bleeding witness of my hatred by, having God, her conscience, and these bars against me, and I no friends to back my suit at all, but the plain devil and dissembling looks. And yet, to win her, all the world to nothing. Ha! <laughs> Has she forgot already the brave prince, Edward, her lord, whom I, some three months since, stabbed in an angry mood at Tewkesbury? A sweeter and lovelier gentleman, framed in the prodigality of nature, young, valiant, wise, and no doubt right royal, the spacious world cannot again afford. And will she yet abase her eyes on me, that cropped the golden prime of this sweet prince, and made her widow to a woeful bed? On me, whose all not equals Edward's moiety, on me that halts and am misshapen thus, my dukedom to a beggarly denier, I do mistake my person all this while. Upon my life she finds, although I cannot, myself to be a marvelous proper man. I'll be at charges for a looking glass and entertain a score or two of tailors to study fashions to adorn my body. Since I am crept in favor with myself, I will maintain it with some little cost. Richard revels in the fact that he was able to manipulate this young woman. And he's like, me, this ugly, nasty man who killed her whole family, and she's willing to take me. Oh, this is rich. This is rich. And the audience just kind of eats it up, right? We, we listen to him and we're like, oh my goodness, this guy is crazy, he's audacious, he's such a jerk, and yet he's so charming. In scene three, we have the queen who is surrounded by her brothers, Dorset, Rivers, and Grey. And they're feeling lots of tension, especially now that Clarence has been imprisoned. Because if Edward dies, they know that there is going to be some tension in the future. And in a few moments, in comes Buckingham and Stanley, and then a few moments later, in comes Richard and Hastings. And all these characters are squabbling. Because if you remember, Hastings doesn't like the brothers of the Queen because he feels like they were the ones responsible for him being thrown in the tower. Nobody likes Richard. He acts as if he's so innocent and everything, but they all can kind of see that he's a threat to them. So everybody is squabbling when all of a sudden in comes Queen Margaret, Henry's old wife. 
and she kind of floats in the background for a little while, saying comments, and it's unclear whether anybody hears her. They all ignore her, and she keeps saying things, biting comments related to the, the different bickering going back and forth. And finally, she steps forward and begins to vent her ire on all of them. Hear me, you wrangling pirates that fall out in sharing that which you have pilled from me. Which of you trembles not that looks on me? If not that I am queen, you bow like subjects. Yet that by you deposed, you quake like rebels. Richard immediately calls her a foul, wrinkled witch. And she does have that witch-like quality. She's the symbol of all that they've destroyed in order to get what they've got right now. And they don't like being reminded of it. In fact, they've all been squabbling back and forth, but at this moment they all turn on her and begin saying, Ooh, we don't like you. In fact, Queen Margaret says, What? Were you snarling all before I came, ready to catch each other by the throat, and turn you all your hatred now on me? Did York's dread curse prevail so much with heaven that Henry's death, my lovely Edward's death, their kingdom's loss, my woeful banishment, should all but answer for that peevish brat? They, after all, hate her for her bloodthirstiness back in the war. But she turns around and curses all of them, cursing them for what they've done to her family and cursing them all with pain in each other. She knows they're all going to regret Richard eventually. She curses each one of them for the role that they played in her husband's death and in her son's death and in her banishment. And she turns and begins to curse Richard, and she's really laying into him when he interrupts her by calling her name. And this is enough to kind of spoil the moment and break the charm, and all of them just kind of laugh her off at that point. And she tries to finish her curse that she got interrupted in, but none of them are really listening anymore, and eventually she kind of wanders out of the scene. And so then they all go back to being really tense with each other until Catesby comes in to tell them that um, the king wants to see the queen. They all exit except for Richard, who establishes that at this point he's making sure things keep moving. He is organized for Clarence to be murdered. And he's already got plots in his mind to get rid of all these other characters. Two murderers come in and he directs them to go make sure they kill Clarence. Best to go ahead and kill him before talking to him because he can be slick-tongued. Scene four cuts to the tower where Clarence is in prison and he's had a bad dream. He dreamed about his brother Richard and he dreamed about falling into water and being pulled down and ultimately destroyed with a reminder of all of his betrayals on his head. And all this dream was horrifying to him, and he wakes up and he remembers betraying Warwick, and he remembers all the, the things that he's done. At this point, two of the murderers come in. He tries to talk them out of killing him, saying, Look, go to my brother Richard. Richard will, will certainly uh, pay you whatever you want to not kill me. And they're like, No, no, actually, Richard is the one that set us on to kill you. And Clarence realizes he's been betrayed by his brother. One of the murderers gets cold feet in the conversation, but the other one is willing to go ahead and kill Clarence. And so Clarence gets the punishment for his crimes from the previous books. Moving on to Act 2. And it looks like Richard of Gloucester is moving up in the world. Scene 1 opens with Edward the King, who's in bed and he's dying, and he's gathered around him all of his people. And so he has his wife, the queen, and all of her family, her brothers. He has people like Hastings and Buckingham, and those who have had lots of tension with uh, the queen's family. And he's trying to make peace between everyone. And everyone, since, you know, he's king and also he's dying, is willing to bury the hatchet and um, make peace. Since I have made my friends at peace on earth, Rivers and Hastings, take each other's hand. Dissemble not your hatred, swear your love, Edward says. And so Rivers and Hastings shake hands. And then King Edward turns to his wife and asks her to make friends with everybody who she had tension with before. And everybody is embracing and everybody is swearing to always be kind to each other from now on. And everything just looks very peaceful. And in comes Richard of Gloucester. And Edward says, hey, look, we've managed to get everybody to make friends now. And Richard replies, A blessed labor, my most sovereign lord, among this princely heap, if any here by false intelligence or wrong surmise, hold me a foe. If I unwittingly or in my rage have aught committed, that is hardly borne by any in the, this presence. I desire to reconcile me to his friendly peace. So Richard says, I want to make peace with everybody too. And he concludes by saying, I do not know that any Englishman alive with whom my soul is any jot at odds more than the infant that is born tonight. I thank my God for my humility. 
Richard really knows how to lay on the smarm. And Queen Elizabeth says, oh, what a wonderful day. If only now we could make peace with your brother Clarence because none of them have heard yet that Richard has killed Clarence. And Richard responds and says, oh, why, madam, have I offered love for this to be so flouted in this royal presence? Who knows not that the gentle Duke is dead? Everybody knows the Duke's dead. And everybody did not know that, and they are all stunned by the news. Edward is horrified to hear that Clarence has been killed, and he says, I didn't mean for that to happen. Now I regret throwing him in, in the tower. Now I regret all of the, the tension between the two of us. And Richard says, yeah, you know, your message to kill him just went through so fast, and your retraction of that message was just so slow. It just didn't make it in time. And the king is broken about it. He's grieving over his brother and over uh, what has become of their relationship, how, how Clarence is now dead and he leaves the room along with the queen and, and her brothers. And Richard notes particularly how nervous the queen and her family look at the news that Clarence is dead, because that means that Richard is now more in charge. In scene two, we meet the old Duchess of York, that is Richard, Edward, and Clarence's mother. And she is with the children of Clarence, and she's trying to comfort them um, over the fact that their father is now dead. And she's grieving and trying to to dance around the topic with them, when in comes Queen Elizabeth. And she is also in despair because now King Edward has just died. And not only has she lost her husband, but she's also in a very dangerous position. And Elizabeth and the Duchess, to some extent, compete in their loss and in their grief. And this is going to be another scene that's mirrored later in the play. Both of them have lost a husband, and in losing their family, um, they see things getting darker and darker for themselves. And Queen Elizabeth's family encourage her to send her oldest son to be crowned as soon as possible, to become the king. And Richard comes in with some of his current cronies, and they're here to help bring the prince to be crowned. Richard is going to be right there in the midst of things and making sure that he has a special hand in taking care of the young princes. This is clearly ominous, and nobody is happy with this situation. So they all head out to make the young prince the new king. Scene three cuts to random citizens who are discussing the political upheaval. Remember that we've just come out of the War of the Roses, and there's been a lot of overthrow of kings, there's been a lot of civil war, there's been a lot of change of leadership. And so all the citizens are holding their breath to find out, okay, how is this new transition of power going to go? In scene four, we return to Queen Elizabeth and the Duchess of York, who are waiting to hear news about her son being crowned king. And while they're waiting, they're talking to her younger son, um, who is now the Duke of York, but the young princeling, who is uh, commenting on things that he's heard his uncles say. His uncle Rivers, who's his mother's family, and also his uncle Gloucester, Richard. And in the midst of this conversation, in comes a messenger who lets them know that during the whole coronation sequence, the queen's family, all of her brothers, have been arrested and imprisoned by Richard. And the queen is scared. She knows that she's in trouble now. Richard is consolidating power and taking control of everything. And so she takes her younger son and she rushes into the church for sanctuary. She is really scared of Richard getting his hands on her son. Act three. In act three, Richard arrives with the newly crowned young prince and all of his entourage into London, and they've taken sort of a roundabout way to get here. And as they arrive, the prince wonders where his brother and mother are, and they're told by Hastings that she's gone into sanctuary in the church. And so Buckingham sends the guards in and says, no, we're taking that kid out of sanctuary. He can't claim sanctuary. The mom can, sure, but not him. So we're going to get the young prince. And so the young prince says, well, where are my brother and I going to stay until the coronation? And Richard goes, you know where it would be a good place? I think maybe the tower. You'll be really safe in the tower. And so Hastings comes back with the young Duke of York, the prince's younger brother, and uh, they're getting ready to put them in the tower. And young York here is making lots of really witty, sarcastic statements against Richard, who obviously is really gritting his teeth. And so then Hastings takes the two little princes and carries them off to the tower to keep them safe. And as they all leave, 
Buckingham and Richard and Catesby gather together to talk about what to do about these princes, and also what to do about Hastings. Now, Hastings has obviously been on their side and been happy to get rid of the Queen's family, but Hastings is a loyalist, and he's loyal to Edward and to Edward's children. So they aren't sure that he will abandon the princes for their sake. But Richard is ready to get rid of these obnoxious little princes and become king himself. So they're going to sound out Hastings just in case. Scene two is Hastings at home and he's getting ready and he's just delighted that uh, the queen's family have been taken out. But Catesby comes in and starts talking to him and starts hinting around him that maybe we shouldn't let the prince be king. Maybe we should, you know, change it and hand it over to Richard. And Hastings is, no, no, are, are you kidding? We need to keep things under the a proper line. This is Edward's line. No, I'm faithful to the princess. And so we see him reveling and, and laughing at the fate of the, the queen's brothers. But... We don't, he doesn't realize that his own doom is coming nearer as he betrays Richard. And so after feeling him out, Catesby and Buckingham both plan on reporting this all to Richard, and they know that Hastings is now going to be marked for destruction as well. We cut to scene three, where Rivers and Grey, the Queen's family, are heading to their death. And in this moment, they begin to remember something. They remember Margaret's curse on them. Remember that? And so this is the beginning of those curses finally falling on the heads of all those people that were her enemies who she rained down curses upon. Gray says, Now Margaret's curse has fallen upon our heads when she exclaimed on Hastings, you and I, for standing by when Richard stabbed her son. And Rivers says, Then cursed she Richard, then cursed she Buckingham, then curse she Hastings. Oh, remember God to hear her prayer for them as now for us. And for my sister and her princely sons, be satisfied, dear God, with our own true blood, which as thou knowest unjustly must be spilt. So he hopes that the curses will rain down on all of their enemies as well, since it's come down on them. But please protect uh, my sister and her children. And then in scene four, Oh no, this is interesting. This is the outfit I usually use when I'm talking about media bias, like back in Julius Caesar. I wonder what media bias has to do with Richard III. In scene four, we're getting ready for the coronation of the young prince. And so when Richard of Gloucester discovers that Hastings is not going to support him, he then accuses Hastings of witchcraft, producing some trumped up evidence, and then sends him off to be executed. Hastings realizes he's been played by Richard, the man he put his faith in for a long time. And he says, woe, woe for England, not a wit for me, for I too fond might have prevented this. Stanley did dream the boar did raise his helm, and I did scorn it and disdain to fly. Three times today my footcloth horse did stumble, and started when he looked upon the tower, as loath to bear me to the slaughterhouse. Oh, now I need the priest that spake to me. Now I repent, I told the pursuivant, as too triumphing, how my enemies today at Pomfret bloodily were butchered, and I myself secure in grace and favor. Oh, Margaret, Margaret, now thy heavy curse is lighted on poor Hastings' wretched head. He was so enjoying watching the Queen's family get butchered for him, and now he's going to face the same fate. In scene five, Richard and Buckingham now have to cover for the fact that they've killed Hastings. And so they create this fake riot in order to put the blame on Hastings and excuse their quick murder of him shifting the narrative around a bit. Once the mayor listens to them, Richard sends Buckingham out to stir the people up, and he's going to start spreading these stories about the princes, that they aren't really that legitimate. And actually, Edward isn't even really that legitimate. And Richard goes so far as to almost defame his own mother in order to pull off this narrative that makes him look like a more noble and worthy king than the princes. Scene six cuts to a scrivener, and although this is a tiny throwaway scene, it is incredibly profound and somewhat apropos to our own world. The scrivener is holding a paper which tells of all the crimes that Hastings committed. And as he's looking at this paper, which he was asked to draft up, he begins to reflect on the irregular timeline that this was given to him. He says, here is the indictment of the good Lord Hastings, which in a set hand fairly is engrossed, that it may be today read or in Paul's. 
and mark how well the sequel hangs together. Eleven hours I have spent to write it over, for yesternight by Catesby it was sent to me. The precedent was full as long a doing, and yet within these five hours Hastings lived, untainted, unexamined, free, at liberty. Here's a good world the while. Who is so gross that cannot see this palpable device? Yet who so bold but says he sees it not? Bad is the world, and all will come to naught, when such ill dealing must be seen in thought. So 11 hours ago, he was given a draft of this statement that he was going to write up to be read, telling of all of Hastings' crimes. And yet, only five hours ago, Hastings was an innocent man. So clearly the story was pre-written in kind of a suspicious way. Who is so gross that cannot see this palpable device? Who can't see through this fake story? And yet, who's going to have the guts to stand up to the powerful people that are pushing this narrative. In scene seven, Richard comes in and Buckingham tells how things went. Buckingham tried to stir up the crowds to support Richard and get them all to cheer for him and call for him as king, and it really didn't work that well. The people just weren't buying it. A few people were like, meh. And Richard's like, didn't you hit all the talking points? Didn't you, you know, emphasize the illegitimacy of, of the princes and all that? And Richard says, yeah, he, I did, and I even like placed some people in the crowd to say, yay, Richard, and, and they shouted, but not many people followed suit. It was pretty unimpressive. But Buckingham just powered through his speech and made it seem like they were really on his side, even though the people clearly aren't. And so then Buckingham and Richard decide that Richard is going to act like he doesn't really want to be king. He's going to go look really busy and, and really important doing holy things with a, with a couple of priests. And when the mayor comes in and asks him to be king, he's going to be really reticent and hesitant. And when the mayor and the citizens come in, Buckingham's like, I'm not sure that Richard is going to want to do it. He didn't seem like he was really interested in being king. Buckingham says, aha, my lord, this prince is not an Edward. He is not lulling on a lewd love bed, but on his knees at meditation. Not dallying with a brace of courtesans, but meditating with two deep divines. Not sleeping to engross his idle body, but praying to enrich his watchful soul. So good old Richard's in there, just such a holy, wonderful person. He doesn't have a guilty bone in his whole body, unlike our awful old Edward we had before. Happy were England, would this virtuous prince take on his grace the sovereignty thereof. But sure, I fear, we shall not win him to it. And so finally they get Catesby to call Richard out and he comes out really hesitant and like, oh, what is it that you all want? And he's standing between these two priests to look really special and really holy. And then Buckingham and Richard have this really theatrical thing going on back and forth where Buckingham is standing down below with the mayor and saying, oh, please, we need you. You're the hero our kingdom needs to rescue us in this time. You're the one who can step up and be our true noble king. And Richard's all like, no, no, no. And acts as though he, he never thought of such a thing. Very theatrical. And finally Richard says, will you enforce me to a world of cares? Call them again. I am not made of stones, but penetrable to your kind entreaties, albeit against my conscience and my soul. And so finally, Richard accepts the crown and he becomes the king. What he's been working towards this whole play. Act 3 culminates in his kingship. But as we enter into Act 4, we have to begin to ask the question. With his ambitions finally fulfilled and him getting everything that he wants, what kind of king will he be? And will he still have the same charisma and power that he did in his ambition now that he's finally where he wants to be? Alas, we will see quite a turning as Richard begins his true kingship. Just when you think you're getting where you're supposed to be, things start getting chaotic and messed up. Here's my book. Okay, so in Act 4, Richard III, he's finally king. He's finally gotten what he wanted. And yet now it seems like he's pushed too far and overplayed his hand. Let's see how this pans out. We start basically at the moment when Richard is heading off to coronation and we cut over to some other very important characters. We've got Queen Elizabeth again. And she's with her son Dorset from her previous marriage before she was Edward's wife and also uh, the Duchess of York, Richard and Edward's mother. And they meet up with Anne, Richard's wife. 
and all of them are going together to try to see the princes. And they arrive at the tower, but they're refused entry. The lieutenant says, no, you don't have permission to see them by orders of the king. And of course, that all takes them back. They say, king? And the lieutenant says, oh, I mean, I mean, the Lord Protector. And Queen Elizabeth says, the Lord protect him from that kingly title. Boy, do I not want him to be king. And all of them are shaken a little bit by that sound. When in comes Stanley to take Anne and go coronate her with Richard, to the immense horror of all of them. So now their worst fears are realized. They're not able to see the princes in the tower. Richard is stepping up to the throne and all of them are in so much trouble. So the queen immediately turns to her son Dorset and says, you need to get out of here. He's gonna kill you. You, you run. And Stanley's like, yeah, yeah, you need to run. Anne is horrified at the thought of becoming queen, realizing just how absolutely dreadful this is, and she also heavily suspects that Richard will probably kill her soon, too. And all of them feel a sense of imminent doom. The only hope is beginning to sparkle on the horizon is Richmond, who has another claim to the throne and may be able to get rid of this awful Richard. In scene two, Richard just has been coronated. He's stepped down from the coronation and he feels pretty good. He's king. But now that he's gotten everything that he wants, he's got to be able to hold on to it. And so he turns to Buckingham, who's been his stout supporter this entire time. And he says, you know what? I'm king, but uh, you know, the little princes, they're still alive. And that kind of threatens my throne. We need to do something about that. And Buckingham turns a little pale and is like, Okay. He obviously is not enthused by the idea of killing children. Richard says, tut tut, thou art all ice, thy kindness freezes. Say, have I thy consent that they shall die? And Buckingham doesn't say, no, I think we should let the princes live. Instead he says, give me some little breath, some pause, dear lord, before I positively speak in this. I will resolve you here and presently. So Buckingham has been by his side and helped to orchestrate all of these things up until now, but now all of a sudden at the thought of killing innocent children, he gets cold feet. Of course, he doesn't just jump in and say, no, I can't do that. He's not strong in his defiance against Richard, but any sign of coldness to Richard is treason in his mind. And so you know Buckingham is, is in trouble now. And Richard is clearly angry, and he's clearly upset. And so then Richard turns and, and looks for somebody who will, will take the part of a murderer who will kill babies. And he finds Tyrrell to do it for him. And then he begins to think, okay, in order to secure my position here, you know, I've, I've killed the princes, but then I've got to get rid of Anne because, you know, she's, she's more of a liability now that I'm on the throne. She's not helping me anywhere. I need to um, marry someone who will further secure my position in the throne. I know, I'll marry my niece after I've killed her brothers. And yeah, I think I'll probably have to get rid of Clarence's children too. And so he's plotting all these things for all of his nieces and nephews, horrible things. And then Buckingham comes back in and he says, hey, you remember how you promised when I got you on the throne that you would make me the Earl of Hereford? And Richard just ignores him and just walks on and keeps talking to other people in his life and talking about all of his problems. And Buckingham keeps, keeps asking over and over, do you remember your promise? Do you remember your promise? And Richard finally turns to him and, and compares him to a striking bell that keeps resounding over and over and over again. And he says, I'm not in a giving vein today. And Buckingham gets the hint because at this point he's no longer in the favor of Richard. And anybody who's not in the favor of Richard is probably gonna have his head off really fast. And so Buckingham says, I need to cut and run. And so he leaves. Scene three, Tyrrell comes back from killing the children, uh, dead babies. And he talks about how sweet and innocent they were as they were murdered. And he tells Richard, and Richard is satisfied that the princes are dead. At least that problem is resolved. But then he begins to get a series of bad news, starting in this scene and continuing through the rest of the act. The first bit of bad news that he gets is that he's beginning to lose his support. Of course, he's burned bridge after bridge after bridge. So uh, the consequences of that are beginning to catch up with him. And some of his supporters have left and joined Richmond. And of course, Buckingham himself has left and tried to pull together an army. Scene four is a great counterpoint to some of the scenes in the first act. It begins with Queen Margaret. She's back! She only gets two scenes in this play, and yet she resonates throughout the entire thing. And here she is, this image of old, withered, angry bitterness. But now as she returns and she sees Queen Elizabeth and the Duchess of York, 
they all have something in common. They all have lost family members to corruption and scheming. And Richard is at the heart of all of it. And so Margaret is half smug, half sympathetic, I think. And there's multiple ways you could play this scene. Um, she definitely is pleased that they've gotten what was coming to them. But she also recognizes in their pain, her own pain. And so there's a kind of twisted empathy throughout this moment. I had an Edward till a Richard killed him. I had a husband till a Richard killed him. Thou hast an Edward till a Richard killed him. Thou hast a Richard till a Richard killed him. And all of them are in severe pain and grief here. Of course, Margaret's has boiled down into an intense kind of bitterness. And Elizabeth turns to her and says, you said you would teach me how to curse. Uh, it's time. I'm ready to start cursing Richard. And Margaret says, well, all you need to do is continue to steep in your pain and your grief, and they, your grief will actually teach you how to curse him. And in spite of feeling that connection and that empathy, Margaret does not give her any comfort. But all of them seem to live on in the hope of seeing Richard pay for all of this. And then at that point, Margaret exits and a trumpet sounds and in comes Richard. And so we get a mirror of the cursing scene at the beginning, but now it's going to be followed by a mirror of the wooing scene at the beginning. Remember when Richard wooed Anne? Well, at this point, he's killed her off, off stage, and he wants to marry Queen Elizabeth's daughter. And when the Duchess and Elizabeth see him, they curse him. His own mother hates his guts. And she talks about the agony of the childbirth, but how him coming out and entering her world made her world even worse. Thou camest on earth to make my, the earth my hell. A grievous burden was thy birth to me. Tetchy and wayward was thy infancy. Thy school days frightful, desperate, wild, and furious. Thy prime of manhood daring, bold, and venturous. Thy age confirmed, proud, subtle, sly, and bloody. More mild, but yet more harmful, kind in hatred. What comfortable hour canst thou name that ever graced me with thy company? And so she curses him and says, I hope you get yours, and I hope all the ghosts of the people you've killed come back to help your enemies and haunt you. And she leaves. And Queen Elizabeth is about to leave as well, but then Richard comes up to her and says, oh, I have this suit for you. I want to marry your daughter. And he tries to pull off that same audacious wooing that he did with Anne. Elizabeth is, of course, horrified, and she's trying to find any way to keep her daughter out of this. Richard says, you have a daughter called Elizabeth, virtuous and fair, royal and gracious. And Queen Elizabeth says, and must she die for this? Oh, let her live, and I'll corrupt her manners, stain her beauty, slander myself as false to Edward's bed, throw over her the veil of infamy, so she may live unscarred of bleeding slaughter. I will confess she was not Edward's daughter. I'll do anything to save her. Just please leave her alone. You've killed everyone else in my life that I love. And they go back and forth and back and forth. And Richard says, well, tell me, teach me how to woo her. And Elizabeth says, you can't. You are so covered in the blood of her family. What are you going to do? Go up and like wipe her tears away with your bloody hands? And Richard, again, tries to spin everything just like he did with Anne, making, twisting all the evil that he's done into something that seems like it was for her love and for her future good. And Elizabeth answers him line for line until finally he begins to try to swear by things. And she points out that everything he could possibly swear by, he has already violated. His crown is stolen. His garter of knighthood is profaned, but as he presses and presses her, she finally says, shall I be tempted of the devil thus? Shall I forget myself to be myself? Shall I go win my daughter to thy will? And she begins to answer him with these kinds of questions, and so he thinks he's won, and then she walks off and he's like, ha ha, I still got it. But the thing is, she is not going to go woo her daughter for Richard, even though Richard thinks so. He feels like he's been successful, but all of his techniques in the past have begun to wear thin on absolutely everyone. And even though he thinks he's won this wooing match, instead, Elizabeth is sending her daughter over to marry not Richard, but Richmond. At this moment, many messengers come in with lots of bad news. Richmond is coming across the sea. He's got a big army. So many of your own people are unwilling to fight for you, and many of them are beginning to defect. And Richard gets more and more angsty, and he begins to try to shout out commands at different people, but his commands are contradictory and incomplete. He's clearly losing control of the situation. And when a messenger finally comes up with one more message, he smacks the man before the message comes out, thinking it's just more bad news. When in actuality, it is that Buckingham's army has been destroyed and melted away. He apologizes and, and rewards the messenger, but clearly he's losing control of himself and of his kingdom. 
everything is falling apart. All of his charm that he used to get where he is has worn off. He does finally get the news that Buckingham has been taken, so that's the one good thing. So he's finally going to be able to get his revenge on Buckingham. He also corners Stanley and says, Stanley, I don't trust you anymore. I think you'll defect to Richmond, and so I'm going to take your son, and I'm going to keep him here, and if you do anything wrong, I'll kill him. So that's the way he's trying to hold control over the situation. Kind of reminding us of Machiavelli, who says that to be loved is good, but to be feared is greater. He's clearly leaning heavily on the fear thing, but he's overdone it and he's losing control. His Machiavellian charm is gone. And so Act 4 ends in Scene 5 with Stanley writing a letter to Richmond saying, I can't help you right now because if I do, my son will die. But here's the situation. And so we get to Act 5. Well, hey, it's now Act 5 and it looks like I'm a ghost. So let's see what that's all about. In scene one, we have Buckingham, who is being led to his death. As we have seen in many other characters before this, he's the last one to finally get the curse of Margaret upon him, and he remembers that as he's heading to his death. And he, like many before him, recognized the error of his ways, and more so than any other, because after all, he was truly in it thick. Uh, with Richard until just recently. In scene two, here comes Richmond. He has arrived and he is gearing up to fight with Richard. I should pause for just a moment and remind us who Richmond is. So Richmond is of the House of Lancaster. If we follow the family tree back, he's got a link to Henry IV. And so he's got a claim to the throne as well. And not only that, but it seems like now he's going to be able to ultimately marry Elizabeth the daughter of Queen Elizabeth and Edward IV, and that should give him the opportunity, ultimately, to unite the sides of York and Lancaster, which is how we're ending this book. This is the end of the War of Roses and the beginning of the Tudor line, because Henry Richmond's father was a Tudor. And of course, the Tudor line becomes the line of Queen Elizabeth I, and that is the line, of course, that Shakespeare is writing most of these plays under. In any case, Richmond definitely feels like he's in the moral right in his fight against Richard, and he's talking back and forth with Stanley, who you remember in the last act was um, holding back and staying on Richard's side only for the protection of his own son. Scene three of Act Five is the meat of Act Five. It is the most elaborate scene here. And uh, let me give you a quick summary of what happens in this scene. So first of all, we have on one side of the stage, Richmond and his army. On the other side of the stage, we have Richard and his army. And both of them come in, they prepare for the evening, knowing they're going to battle with each other in the next morning. They both then set up their tents and finish their business and go to sleep. During the night, they have a series of visions, and then ultimately they wake up, and each of them has an opportunity to give a pep talk or a speech to inspire the armies before they go to war. And so that's the general structure of the scene. We see what's kind of happening the night before on both sides of the camp. And we see the growing confidence of Richmond on the one hand and the growing paranoia of Richard on the other hand. And Richard keeps boasting and trying to be confident. He has a huge army. He, he's in the right because he's king and Richmond is a usurper. But again, like we saw earlier with the whole concept of propaganda, both sides see themselves in the right. Or at least they put forth that speech or that face. And that can be clearly seen in the two orations to the armies in the very end. But while Richard is, you know, snooping on his armies and, and trying to weed out anybody who might have any sort of hesitation in backing him, Richmond is feeling more and more confident. He's feeling strength from the messages he's getting back and forth with Stanley. And clearly Stanley doesn't want to be fighting against Richmond because they're closely related. Stanley married Richmond's mother after his father passed away. But the best part of this is when they finally settle down to sleep. On one side of the stage, Richmond is sleeping somewhat peacefully, and on the other side, we have Richard who's in this tormented sleep. And these visions begin to appear. And they are the visions of all of the ghosts of the people that Richard killed. Starting with Prince Edward, the son of Henry VI. We have Henry VI himself, who was stabbed multiple times in the tower by Richard. We have Clarence, who died at the beginning of this play. We have Rivers, Grey, and Vaughn. Of course, the Queen's family, who were all beheaded. We have the two young princes who were killed. We have Hastings, we have Lady Anne, we have Buckingham. So each of the people that Richard has destroyed in his quest for power walk up to his sleeping body and 
recite his crimes against them and conclude by saying, despair and die, die in the battlefield tomorrow. And then they walk over to Richmond on the other side of the stage and they give him hope and they give him strength, whether or not they would have sided with Richmond in their own lives. For instance, Clarence, who's clearly of the House of York, says, Thou offspring of the House of Lancaster, the wronged heirs of York do pray for thee. Good angels guard thy battle, live and flourish. And so all of these people are rooting for Richmond. They're rooting for the final death and failure of Richard III. And so after this parade of ghosts, Richard and Richmond both wake up. Richmond feels great, but Richard is tormented. And he has this great soliloquy, this moment where he recognizes where he's come. Now, it may not be quite as good as some of the soliloquies in Macbeth or Hamlet, but it is a moment of recognition for Richard. Up to this time, he's constantly been seeking his own desires. He finally got what he wanted, and then it just crumbled to dust in his hand. And he's finally, I guess, seeing himself for the first time in this moment. And he wakes from this dream and looks around himself, realizing that it was just a dream. He says, O oh, coward conscience, how dost thou affect me? The light burns blue, it is now dead midnight. Cold, fearful drops stand on my trembling flesh. What do I fear? Myself? There's none else by. Richard loves Richard. That is, I am I. Is there a murderer here? No. Yes, I am. Then fly, what, from myself? Great reason why, lest I revenge. What, myself upon myself? Alack, I love myself. Wherefore? For any good that I myself have done unto myself? Oh, no. Alas, I rather hate myself for hateful deeds committed by myself. I am a villain. Yet I lie, I am not. Fool, of thyself speak well. Fool, do not flatter. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. Perjury, perjury in the highest degree, murder, stern murder in the direst degree, all several sins, all used in each degree, thronged to the bar, crying all guilty, Guilty, I shall despair. There is no creature loves me, and if I die, no soul will pity me. And wherefore should they, since that I myself find in myself no pity to myself? Methought the souls of all that I had murdered came to my tent, and every one did threat tomorrow's vengeance on the head of Richard. So, he has this moment of clarity when he finally everything bad that he's done catches up to his conscience, I guess. And he has a back and forth for just a moment saying, oh, there's nothing to be afraid of. Nobody here but me. And then he recognizes himself as the great villain, the horror of everything that he's done. And he recognizes in all of this that he actually loathes himself, as does everyone else. There's nobody that loves him. How could they with all that he's done? And he hates himself as well. It certainly sets a bad tone for the morning and for the battle coming on. And so the two get ready and give their speech to their armies. It's worth comparing the two. Both of them talk about being in the right, their own side being the virtuous side, and the other side being the loathsome evil side. We're the good guys, they're the bad guys. It's kind of what you'd expect. At that point, they begin to march into battle, and Richard realizes that Stanley is not joining him in battle. And so he says, fine, I'll go ahead and kill his kid. But the battle is ensuing, and Richard doesn't have time to execute young George Stanley. And so he sets off to fight. Scene four is the disastrous scene of battle. Richard's been running everywhere, trying to find and kill Richmond, and he keeps killing people he thinks are Richmond, but it's never him. And he's lost his horse, and he's in a rage, and he's trying to find Richmond. My kingdom for a horse! And we finally have this moment where the two of them come together and they battle and Richmond kills Richard. And so we come to the conclusion where Richmond is crowned as the new king. He's going to be Henry VII and he's going to marry Elizabeth. And so the two houses, the House of Lancaster and the House of York, have finally been reunited in this marriage and this is going to bring about peace for our country. Barefaced peace. Yay, it's the end. I also have to note that the book I'm using for this video is from Mary Kate Wiles of Shipwrecked fame. So thank you to one of my favorite YouTubers for 
letting me get your book so I can teach Shakespeare from it. Well, that was fun and exciting. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or to watch another Shakespeare video of mine, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.